For me, crypto is empowering different groups of people. Like it's by abstracting them a dimension above the general economy so that they can organize themselves more efficiently than by having to organize themselves in the fiat world where fees are being taken out of their every transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and organizing doesn't just mean buying and selling. It, it means getting aligned with their own interests and through financial leverage, enforcing their, their way on the world. Here we are with Ruben Galindo, uh, co-founder and CEO of AirTM. Um, thanks for coming on The Defiant. Uh, I, I always, I have a soft spot for people building for Latin America. Uh, so I uh, would love to hear more about how, you know, what AirTM is doing and, uh, and what use cases you're, you're seeing developing there. Uh, well, thanks for having me on The Defiant. It's exciting to be at a crypto native sort of ecosystem. Um, so maybe I'll take it a little bit back mm -hmm, sure. uh, to when AirTM began. Mm -hmm. Maybe even before stable coins. Mm -hmm. uh, AirTM launched in January, I think January 2015. Wow, okay. And we, we were sort of looking at how people were adopting crypto. It was very weird for us. We worked at a crypto exchange, but we didn't really understand why people used it. Mm -hmm. And so in looking at the use cases, we realized that a lot of people were using it to hedge against inflation in Argentina. And to us, it, it was mind blowing. There were people in 2015 that couldn't preserve their wealth because their government prevented them from saving in dollars or from buying dollars. Yeah. And so people resorted to this black market because, you know, people, they figure it out. Mm -hmm. And in this black market, they would buy physical dollar bills peer to peer in little storefronts in order to preserve their wealth. And of course, these notes, they would keep under their mattress. There was some staggering number of US dollar notes or bills in Argentina. It was a huge proportion of the overall amount of sort of bills was in Argentina. It was crazy to us. Um, and fun fact, a $100 bill was worth more than a $20 bill because it was easier to carry. Imagine ah, that. Okay. So there was because a the cost okay. of, a weight, of the weight yeah. um, was higher. It's insane. And so we thought it was crazy that only the, well, one, that people had to resort to this. Two, that governments were restraining people uh, in this way. And three, that if you were an average Joe, it was even more difficult for you to have access to, to this, this, I guess, dollar buying system. Because it's sort of elitist. The more you buy, the better the rate, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so we decided to build a crypto alternative for it. So we, we grabbed the infrastructure that was around back then. Essentially, um, I guess, a stable coin primitive. It was within an exchange called Uphold. Mm -hmm. It was basically the dollar balance that you could trade against the Bitcoin there. Okay. And so that's what we used to give people access to basically wrapped up uphold accounts that people could use to have virtual dollars. We call them AirUSD. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were on a quasi blockchain. So it was basically a, a stable coin back then. And next to it, we built this marketplace for people to buy and sell dollars amongst themselves, virtual dollars amongst themselves. So we basically created a digital version of the black dollar market online. So that regardless of who you were, you could participate in this peer-to-peer -peer buying and selling of virtual dollars without restrictions. And we would help the market understand the exchange rate at which the dollars had to tr be traded. And we provided this escrow so that people could trade uh, um, safely. And so that, that blew up. 
Mm. We, we, in Argentina? In Argentina, but it blew up in Venezuela, ah. where the inflation rates were 50% a month. Mm. And we were like basically selling or gifting warm bread when we told people that, um, that they could buy dollars on their ATM without restrictions. And it, when it took off, the government tried to shut us down. But were you, how, how was the on-ramp? Like, did you have like a Venezuelan bank account and people deposited their Bolivars there and then you, you transferred to no, it's, blockchain it's wallet? No, it's through or? this marketplace. Do you okay. remember I just mm -hmm. explained about the, this virtual version of the um, clandestine money brokers? Mm -hmm where we basically made an Uber for it, where if you were a money broker, mm -hmm. you could sell virtual dollars within our system to clients who wanted to buy them. So okay. if you wanted to make a deposit, mm -hmm. we would basically introduce you to this random person, Jose, mm -hmm. who would sell you their virtual dollars with an ATM in exchange for you to send them local currency. And so we didn't have mm -hmm. local bank accounts. And how did you solve the custody? Well, it was custodied by BitReserve, by Uphold, the ah, exchange. okay, I see. So it was mm. all a wrapper of that. That was like the first MVP. Mm. We were leveraging all third-party infrastructure. The only novelty was a marketplace. Mm. You could buy peer-to-peer. -peer. It's like local Bitcoins or Binance's peer-to-peer. -peer. Mm. It was the first one. Um, I guess local Bitcoins and us, we were the first ones. Um, anyway, this is how we solved that on-ramp and off-ramp situation. But when the government came after us, our investors were very eager for us to look outside of just Venezuela and outside of just antagonizing the local dictator in a harsh currency regime to make a business. And so we started looking at where our user used us. And we realized that a lot of people used their TM to transform money that they had stuck in PayPal into local currency. Mm. They would basically take their PayPal money and sell it within our marketplace in exchange for ATM dollars. And then they would go from ATM dollars to local currency, mm. leveraging the same marketplace. Um, and that's because you, you explained earlier, going directly <coughs> from PayPal to local dollars, they would have to use the official exchange rate, right? And lose exactly. a, a so bunch of their money. PayPal is subject to leveraging I guess the infrastructure that is compatible with PayPal, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, you have a bank account locally and then you pay out using your bank account, which is under th this licensed infrastructure locally that adheres to the precise markets exchange rates. And well, we don't have to leverage that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We now are actually licensed in Argentina, uh, but also the market is a bit more open so we could leverage the crypto dollar exchange rate and because we leverage that exchange rate well in our marketplace people could trade at that exchange rate they mm. could trade at the open market rate and get access to a good exchange rate going back to the paypal case so people were were choosing to lose 30 percent of their money in their tm in exchange for having a 30 minute cash out mm. so with their tm selling paypal balance to peers and then cashing out through our peer network they were able to get money in their bank account in 30 minutes. But if they had to follow PayPal's native route, they would take seven days to cash out. And so that's when we realized how broken cross-border payments were for people who were getting paid with PayPal or people who worked online. Mm. And it was exactly the same issue with people getting paid with all the other e-wallets. And so it was at that point that Airtim decided to build, I guess, an iteration of an e-wallet, leveraging this new infrastructure. And at the sort of center of it was the idea of an open balance. We realized that the main issue that PayPal had was that once people got paid with it, if PayPal didn't do a decent job of connecting to money locally, then they had to go sell the, the, the PayPal balance on a black market. Mm. But PayPal's balance is very restrained. It's only compatible with a PayPal ecosystem, but if you don't want to buy something on PayPal, then you're stuck with that money. Mm. It's, it's worthless. So you have to you sell it at a steep discount. And so we, we thought, okay, let's build a version of PayPal, 
but that will never cause someone to get their money stuck. So if you get paid with ATM, you could take it wherever. You could mm. take your balance to any other wallet and cash it out or sell it freely because it is your money after all. And so that's when we started getting into sort of crypto in this way. Mm. And I actually, I guess, understand crypto and ourselves in the crypto infrastructure a lot better in hindsight, you know? Mm. Because that's essentially what we're doing. I don't know if we realized it then. Um, that we, 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 I guess, saw crypto as a better solution to help people get paid for work they did cross borders. Mm -hmm. um, of course, w after solving this retail piece, we then said, okay, well, we have to get closer to where people work all these online marketplaces like Airbnb or Patreon or Upwork or YouTube, they, they should be paying people with ATM instead of um, with PayPal, with, with open money instead of with closed loop money. Mm. And so we built marketplace payouts or mass payment systems for, for marketplace, which are basically like peer to peer payouts where it's actually the, the own enterprise paying out with their own, now it's USDC, hmm. to people directly to the person's USDC wallet. And because we leverage USDC for international settlement, well, for one, it's cheaper for us, but two, it takes away a lot of middlemen that used to be in this very straightforward transaction hmm. in order for you to send money with PayPal from one country to another someone actually has to settle that money, you know? And if, if it's actual fiat, well, there needs to be an actual fiat transfer. And like exchange rate conversion and so on, And right? with middlemen, like you mm. need to have bank partnerships that sort of have liquidity in both countries and mm -hmm. they're willing to sell you Argentine pesos here, exchange for dollars here, mm. and it, it's expensive to, to have to use this middleman. And there's, of course, some countries in which PayPal has their own local infrastructure, like Mexico and Brazil, where they're huge markets, they're very well balanced, and th this issue is not very big. And so if you're cashing out via PayPal in Mexico or Brazil, uh, you could do so quite seamlessly and at a very good exchange rate. And you'll be able to cash out your online earnings that same day. But what happens is that in the other 19 countries in Latin America, PayPal is not connected. And there's millions of people who work online in all these countries, and they're getting paid with money that's basically trapped. Mm. It's trapped value. And that's where ATM comes in and where crypto comes in. We, we help these people throughout the global south, not just Latin America, to get paid with open money, with money that they can, of course, hopefully cash out with our own infrastructure, but where we fail, Binance succeeds and they take their money to Binance because maybe Binance is better at cashing out a USDC than AirTM is. Mm. So one, we're always competing with Binance mm. in the cash out. So we, we, of course, our main difference is our, our, um, our fiat on off ramps. But Binance has other very good ones. But because because the rate is better or, or like... Well, sometimes the rate is better, but most times it's because people, some people, like to negotiate the exchange rate. And okay. they like to shop for offers. Mm. The Binance has an open OTC market ah. where people could trade USDC and set their own trade conditions. Mm. And people sometimes like that. So we lose like 25% of our volume that could be withdrawn via ATM goes to Binance. Okay. And that is good because it keeps us honest. Mm. And it makes it such that the e-wallet, which is the place where you earn money, is not very good at cashing you out. We could take your money elsewhere and cash it out, leveraging other rails, which is something that you couldn't do with others. Makes sense. Um, how, how, how big is your ATM now? Like how many <clears> users <throat> do you have? How much volume are you doing? So AirTM has 680,000 active users. Mm -hmm. um, they're each doing on average $2,500 in, in yearly transactions. Okay. Um, and th this, these users are mainly in Latin America? 
We have users in 160 countries. Ah, wow. Okay. Um, and the main use case is people working online, um, getting paid, and receiving those payments, and then c cashing out. I'd say there's two sides of RTM. Okay. One is mass cross-border payment services, mm -hmm. and we have tens of partners, marketplaces mainly, where people work online. Mm -hmm. They use RTM to deliver better payouts to people throughout the global south. That probably represents 25% of our volume. And then we have infrastructure partners that leverage RTM's ability to deliver money throughout the global south in a more direct way. Meaning it's not that they're online earners, it's rather that they need to deliver money to someone locally for whatever reason. Mm. An example is aid. Mm. We have, we do a lot of work with um, so certain governments, the Venezuelan government, for instance, to deliver money back to Venezuela because we're probably the only remittance provider in Venezuela mm. that's super compliant in the US. Mm. And so we do a lot of that work. And then there's other bigger wallets like Payoneer that leverages AirTM as an off-ramp throughout the global south. Mm, I see. And that's, you know, maybe another 15% of AirTM. And then the rest, 65% of our business, maybe a bit more, 70, is, is the retail side of things. It's people either getting paid from one of these partners or it's receiving payments directly to their wallet from the American banking system because we give you an ACH account. Um, or it's people still doing the original PayPal to RTM, RTM to local currency flow, but from all the wallets and all the different closed loop money networks, even Amazon gift cards hmm. into local currency. Interesting. Um, so it's obvious that the like blockchain rails are more efficient than traditional financial rails, especially for cross border transfers, but <coughs> still, um, Blockchain is is very niche and and a, and a small percentage of global cross border payments and, tr and transfers. Why do you think that's still the case? Like we're you know a couple of decades in, um, and like it it seems like it should be more mainstream now. W what's missing? So the reality is that if we are not able to give a better product to the consumer. The consumer won't ever choose our product, right? Mm -hmm. And in the last 10, 15 years, we've built a lot of infrastructure, sure, as an ecosystem. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's better than current cross-border payment infrastructure. And it's, it's important for us to realize that. Mm. I'll explain why in a minute. But the only reason why RTM is able to grow is because we've taken the current infrastructure and created a ton of complementary infrastructure that allows RTM to actually be better than PayPal. But if, if, if as a whole ecosystem, we don't make our end-to-end -end rails, basically, and I guess what that actually means is the cost of minting stable coin and the cost of redeeming stable coin very, very cheap, mm -hmm. then there's no way that we're going to be able to compete against any other of the big cross-border payment providers. Let me give you an example. Everyone here uses MoonPay, and the we use MoonPay too. They're probably the best credit card providers, or I guess on-ramps, the best debit card and credit card on-ramps into, mm. into crypto. They're, they're used by millions and millions of people throughout all the crypto wallets. And their fees, they're very relevant for the crypto market. When you're trying to buy Bitcoin and you're paying 4%, 3%, it's fine. You know, that's probably what you pay in every single crypto exchange. But 3% for someone who's trying to send a cross-border payment just on the first leg of a transaction mm. is almost insurmountable. And so either, and I guess we, we work with MoonPay on this, we, we constantly try to advocate for our use case, the payments use case, mm. and the relevance for them, because you know payments is still a way bigger industry than crypto. 
Um, but there needs to be providers, crypto providers, that are good at providing liquidity and redeeming uh, um, crypto um, at prices that make sense for cross-border payments. And until that sort of pricing holistically gets adopted, and I guess that mindset, by the whole ecosystem, then crypto and I guess our infrastructure will, will not really be relevant for cross-border payments. Interesting. Okay, so your take is that crypto right now isn't offering a better product for cross-border payments and the traditional traditional financial system essentially because the on and off ramps make the process expensive. Basically, mm -hmm. because crypto right now caters to a use case which is different than the payments use case. Mm. And until it tries to cater to the payments use case, it won't fix the problem of payments, which is competing against Wise's five, four, three percent remittance end to end. Mm. Besides the on and off ramp, do you see somewhere else that crypto needs to improve in that, in that or is the rest of the process pretty much figured out? Well, I, I, it's, I don't think it's about crypto needing to improve more. Mm -hmm. um, it's more about entrepreneurs. Um, I guess one realizing that there's all this infrastructure that makes launching a, a PayPal very easy. Mm -hmm. Like you can launch a cross-border payment service very easy. Um, well, PayPal probably had to spend so much time and money building their ledger, their account systems, mm. um, their treasury management systems, uh, their financial controls and operations in order to facilitate th this huge operation. Mm. And they process $1.4 trillion a year, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's readily available. Anyone could use it. And furthermore, Basically, every aspect of the economy is powered by payments. And so right now, anyone can sort of build a very focused payment service for a particular part of the economy, which I think is very powerful. And I think that by having entrepreneurs solve very niche problems, and niches could be billions of people, for mm -hmm. instance, in the case mm -hmm. of Eric Tiamat's a billion people that we expect to be earning money online in, in four years. Mm. Um, but th that entrepreneur will have to s figure out the nuance of, okay, how do I actually make this work for this use case? And it might take better off-ramps, it might take different wa wallet infrastructure, or key storage, or key management uh, mm. solutions, or key recovery, whatever their own nuances. And, and I think that they will, by solving a use case, they'll sort of make crypto better for everyone else. Um, but I don't think it's about problems with crypto. I think it's, it's more about getting specific with a use case hmm. um, by entrepreneurs truly caring about um, a set of consumers and building amazing products for them. Um, so do you think that um, <coughs> will it be these crypto entrepreneurs who figure out these specific use cases, what makes crypto become more massively adopted? Or will it be uh, PayPal, uh, Stripe, I don't know, Robinhood, like the big fintechs adopting crypto and taking it to, to their users? Who knows? Um, it's anyone's bet. Mm -hmm. I will say there's probably a lot of room for both. Um, and I guess my personal opinion would be that it would suck if, <laughs> if the big juggernauts and incumbents in the payments industry in particular are the ones who, who sort of popularize crypto. Although they wouldn't do it if they didn't feel pressure from others taking market from them yeah. and if they didn't feel the need to innovate themselves. I definitely feel like PayPal sort of launching PYUSD is a reaction to what they are seeing in the market and the opportunity that they see to innovate, which I think is, it, it speaks highly of 
what the rest of the industry uh, has been able to accomplish, uh, which is to get PayPal to notice, mm. right? Uh, but I will say that I personally believe in the unbundling of PayPal. Mm. PayPal, uh, as mentioned, processes more than a trillion transactions, There's more than a trillion dollars in transactions every year, and that keeps growing. I think they just killed last quarter. Um, and at the same time, the experience that they offer people is very generalized. It's the same experience for you and you and me and everyone in the world. And yet, you and you and me might be using PayPal for very different reasons. And I guess if we've learned anything from um, the development of, of, I guess, the internet and products that, that sort of arise from it is that at some point a set of consumers or I guess a big platform gets unbundled because their very humongous user base can be broken off into different segments that each merits a particular product to solve their particular solutions. Mm. And I think this crypto infrastructure and blockchain powered payments makes it very easy to, dis, to, to unbundle PayPal because you're going to have just here at this conference 50 different wallet providers that could build PayPal like that. And because they could build PayPal like that and because they're trying to compete against themselves and against PayPal, they're going to have to figure out what the hell they do. Mm -hmm. And basically they're going to say, okay, well, well, what is that one set of users that I want to be the king at? And they're going to try at it, and they're going to build a product that's very uniquely suited for a particular type of, uh, of consumer. Mm. And th that will sort of create better financial services for particular people because they're going to be personalized, because, you know, they're worth it. Yeah, hopefully that translates into yeah better financial access to to everyone. Um, and then to wrap up, what's next for Airtm? Like, what are you working on? What milestones are you excited about? Well, we spend a lot of time thinking. I, I spend a lot of time thinking um, about this this precise mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Like, if it's not just payments that will make Airtm better than PayPal, and if it's not just better payment infrastructure because I think we all agree payments infrastructure just keeps on getting better and better and money tends to get more and more connected. So mm -hmm. in the future, money is just connected, right? And so if that means that the friction from sending money around gets reduced to zero and the cost probably also gets reduced to zero, therefore mm -hmm. the revenues also get reduced to zero. Mm -hmm from companies, transactional companies like RTM, like PayPal, that are facilitating cross-border payments. And so I'm constantly thinking of, okay, if it's not that, if we're all going to have access to that open payment infrastructure, and our money is all going to be connected, then how do you, how do you differentiate yourself? Um, and I guess we, we have our, our answer in RTM, which is, well, building for the digital entrepreneur economy. Hmm. and giving them a place to sort of congregate online as a platform um, because they deserve it. They're, as mentioned, people who work online are already 12% of people who work in the world and th that's already more than 500 million people and we expect that to, to rise to a billion people uh, by 2030. Uh, that is my estimate mm -hmm. from from reports and complementing mm -hmm. with my my optimism okay. <laughs> sure. um, but uh, we really want to build that economy out mm. and for me crypto is, is just that mm. it's creating I guess empowering different groups of people in in I guess by abstracting them a dimension above the general economy so that they can organize themselves more efficiently than by having to organize themselves in the fiat world 
where fees are being taken out of their every transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and organizing doesn't just mean buying and selling. It, it means getting aligned with their own interests and through financial leverage, enforcing their, their way on the world. Awesome. Well, that's really exciting. Thank you so much for sharing with me. You're welcome <laughs> for having me.